Hello, and welcome to episode 44 of my week at the club. And this is my weekly game um, at the, uh, Pit, the Wachusa Chess Club in Fitchburg, Mass. Um, and I, where I bring you the action from uh, whatever board I'm on, happened to be board one this week against Jim Hankard. Um, and that's an interesting game. But before I jump into that, uh, I'd like to give you my Astro tidbit, as I normally do. And as you probably uh, were aware, may have been uh, the InSight uh, mission to Mars, uh, the lander uh, just successfully uh, landed on Mars a couple of days ago. And it's going to be doing um, seismometry and uh, seismology and heat flow experiments on the surface of Mars. And rather than, uh, since there are no results from that yet, rather than to jump into that, I thought maybe I'd just um, mention a little bit about the results of seismology um, on the Earth. Um, if you look over here to the center panel on the right, there's a cutaway view of what the Earth uh, might look like. And the first thing you notice is it looks like it's white hot in the center. Interestingly enough, if you could actually somehow stand in the center, if there were a gap or whatever, and you could be there at the core of the Earth, uh, the temperature there is as hot as the surface of the sun. And so it would be blinding, blindingly light. It wouldn't be dark. It would be brilliantly, brilliantly light and hot. Um, but of course, there's so much pressure that uh, there's no space for anything to stand or to move down there. And the reason it's so hot is because we have uh, multiple layers on the Earth, the outermost of which is the, uh, the lithosphere, or the crust. And it's, it's um, together there may be 100 miles or so of solid rock. And it's a pretty good insulator. I mean, people who live in New England know that you go down about three feet or so below the ground and you get to the point where the, um, the ground doesn't freeze anymore every winter. And so that gives you a sense of the time scale for the, the heat to penetrate um, from the sun over the, the uh, yearly cycle. And so for the, the time that it takes for heat to go through 100 miles of rock is very long, and that's able to keep the center of the Earth very hot. So half of the temperature, it's actually, it's, um, there, there are two coincidences. One, one is that coincidence I already noted on, that the center of the Earth is just about the same temperature as the surface of the sun, which is uh, 6,000 degrees Kelvin, or um, about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the other uh, coincidence is that the source of the um, high temperature in the center of the Earth is, is due to two causes, and they're coincidentally uh, just about uh, similar in magnitude. So uh, about half of it is due to leftover heat from when the Earth was formed, when the uh, meteors collided, and, well, planetesimals collided together to form the Earth. And it was white hot at the time. The other uh, half of the uh, source of the heat flow is just due to radioactivity inside of the Earth. So there's uranium and thorium and I think some radioactive potassium as well, potassium-40. And uh, as they decay, they produce heat, and so that keeps heating up the inside of the Earth. And because it has trouble escaping through the solid rock, um, it gets it up to a very high temperature. And uh, if, if the Earth were fluid, then you'd have convection coming all the way up to the surface and the heat could get out like a bubbling pot. But it's not fluid, it's got a solid surface, so even though the uh, outer core is liquid. Um, the very, very surface of the Earth is solid. There's actually, there's the mantle of the Earth is the next layer down, and it's semi-solid. That is, it would seem solid over our time scales, but over geological time scales, it's actually free to move. And you get some convective heat transport that way. But that's more than you want to know about the center of the Earth, I'm sure. Um, so, on to the chess. The game against uh, Jim was, uh, was actually a modern defense, so uh, I decided to play an e-pawn opening, and he played g6, and so the position we get after two moves, you can either get there from e-pawn opening, or if I'd opened d4, he probably could have done the same thing, and I, I could have responded e4 and been in the same position. Um, I continued on with along a fairly uh, you know, standard opening, standard main lines, um, just uh, developing my minor pieces 
onto uh, what I felt were good squares. Here I'm starting to um, put some pressure once again on this uh, F7 square that was weak in, uh, in the last episode. Um, but he, before I can do any funny business with uh, sacrifices on F7 and night checks and so on, he's able to uh, block up the diagonal with E6. Now here, I, this move I decided it was, um, looks kind of odd, and actually if you look at the uh, databases of, of openings of master play, it turns out that the results with this move are not as good as if I had just moved the, um, if I had just moved the bishop to uh, E3, which I was also thinking about doing. But my, my thought process was that I would put it on G5, and I was hoping to um, maybe get him to um, play this F6 move, which would make his pawn structure um, weak. And you can see this weak pawn now on E6. Uh, and after he played F6, I could retreat my bishop back to E3, um, which is where I want to go. And so that, that wouldn't cost me anything, because it cost me, it would be two moves to go from, um, C1 to G5, and then from G5 back to E3, those two moves, but he would have spent a move coming to F6, so it only cost me net one move, which would be just the same as if I'd moved to E3 in the first place. However, what I didn't count on was the fact that the move he made was the move he wanted to make in any event, was knight to E7. And with this kind of defensive setup, that's actually a... Um, a uh, sensible square for the knight to develop to, and all I've done is sort of encourage him to uh, go along with what he wanted to do. Um, so I, I went ahead with my idea, which was to uh, maybe head toward queenside cast lane, and also if he doesn't prevent it, to uh, put my bishop onto h6 here, um, and uh, to trade off the dark squared bishops, which would be, uh, given his pawn structure on light squares, that would be a, a net plus for white. Um, he had reacted correctly and immediately uh, pushed my bishop away, though, and I had to drop back to e3. Okay, played a6. It turns out this is still a main line in the modern, even though that was well out of my book by now. And I considered playing a4 to stop him from... Um, advancing B5 to B5, so I, I could take, and if he took back, I would take the rook on, on A8. But I didn't do that, um, and now, uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm having a hard time remembering what my thought process was, why I, why I didn't do that. I remember there, there was a reason, um, but uh, darned if I can remember. <laughs> So instead, I just played a3, which you know seemed like a reasonable move, um, protecting. You know, he's threatening to play his knight to g5 and his knight, his pawn to g5, chasing away my bishop with the tempo, and then play a pawn to uh, g4, chasing away my knight, and then this this pawn here will be undefended. Um, I. He wanted to make a prophylactic move against that, and so that's why I ahead of time played a3. So as, as you see there, it's, I, I showed it was a novelty. It's, it's not something you can find in the opening books, and that's because it's it really it's inferior to a4. Not a good novelty. So he did go ahead and play b5. Now I played my bishop back to uh, b3. I, I could have, and I, in fact I considered for quite a while, playing it back to a2, getting it out more out of harm's way. Um, the reason I didn't do that and just left it on b3 was my thinking was that at some point he might play um, a5 and, a, and b4, and I wanted to be able to trade off the pawns and um, have his rook be under attack if he did that, to, to, put a, to prevent him from advancing his pawns like that. And if my bishop were here on, um, on a2, it would be blocking uh, my attack on his rook, and there would be nothing to stop him from doing that. I don't know. That was kind of a weak reason. And I think a uh, more important thing would have been to get the, the uh, bishop out of harm's way, as you'll see a little later in the game. So he played his bishop to b7. 
Let's scroll up a bit here. And I started to advance on the king side, um, trying to make, to give him, um, um, you know, second thoughts about castling over there, because now he's weakened his pawn structure with g6 and h6, and now if my pawn gets up there and can exchange off and form a, a half-open file, um, then it would be very uh, shaky for his king. Okay, that seemed to work. Uh, kept, he didn't didn't castle immediately. Instead, he just developed his uh, knight more to the center and put a second attack here on this uh, knight, on this pawn on e4. So he's got the bishop on it and the knight, and I only have one defense. And so I have to do something about that. Um, I looked at both pawn advances, neither one looked good. So I made another move, which I wasn't particularly crazy about, uh, playing my queen to d3, because it's Oh, and, you know, a waste of time having to move my um, my queen a second time in the opening like that. And also, I, it's a little more exposed out on d3 than it is on d2. And finally, last but not least, on d2, it was attacking along with the bishop, it was attacking this pawn on h6. And that keeps him from castling um, because Right now he has two defenses with the rook and bishop, but if he castles, he only has the bishop. So the queen was well posted on d2. So I sort of kind of hated to make this move, but it seemed necessary. Um, it does allow him to attack my bishop. Um, I could have retreated the bishop, but I chose not to, and instead just went ahead and castled, and he traded it off, and I took back with the pawn. Um, again, stockfish didn't like this move. It wanted me to take back uh, with the queen and preserve my pawn structure. Um, but I figured having another central pawn and opening up half the F file for me um, gives an, puts an imbalance in this uh, position that I, that I was comfortable with. I, I liked the, the resulting kind of position that I got. So he played C6. I, th I think this is not a good move. Um, the problem is that that blocks the bishop's view of uh, e4. So it makes it's temporary, but it, it makes this bishop a less strong piece. And you really want to keep from blocking uh, your bishops if you can. You, he had these nice, beautiful cross cross raking bishops, and now uh, that that bishop for a while is not going to cause me problems. So I went ahead and grabbed some more space on the king side, especially since I'm not castled over there. It seemed like a reasonable thing to do and to really discourage him from castling king side. And he played queen to d7, and now it started to look like he was going to be on the queen side as well. Okay. So here I played that rook to, eight to uh, f1. Now, the reason I did that was because of the following line. I, I, I had this idea that I wanted, that I wanted to play uh, e5, um, advancing in the center, and if he took, which looks like it's, uh, um, forcing it, you know, allowing him to trade off the queens, because if, if I took back with the knight, he could take with the bishop, I take back with the pawn, and then he can trade the queens off. But that wasn't what I was intending to do. What I meant to do was then have a temporary pawn sacrifice with knight to e4 with the idea of coming with the knight into uh, c5 and forking his queen and bishop. So what I thought a uh, line of play might be from this point was um, actually it, it's not castles, that's what's best. What I thought, what I was looking at was that he might play pawn takes pawn uh, in this position. I could attack his queen with my knight. His queen would move. It has to keep defending the bishop. I could take this pawn. Looks like a sack, but when he takes back, it's going to take with the knight, forking the queen and the bishop. And I would get my piece back, and I'd be a couple of pawns ahead. The problem with all this, though, is way back at the beginning, and that's if when I play when I play this e5. Oops, yeah. Okay, in this position, when I play the e5 move, um, he doesn't have to take the pawn. He could have just pushed his c pawn, in which case all of a sudden my 
knight is my undefended knight is under attack here on c3 and um, if it moves my rook is uh, it's pinned to my rook so I would lose the exchange and so I would have to take the time defending the knight and meanwhile I also have to worry about this um, fork of the bishop and queen with, with with him pushing his pawn forward so if I did something stupid like uh, the rook defending the knight he could go ahead and win a piece in this fashion now of course I wouldn't do anything quite that stupid I'd probably retreat the queen to defend the knight and then he could play pawn up and bishop back and we get a something somewhat similar to what we had in the game and it's not very good for white so what I did was to try to prepare my move by moving the uh, rook in the first place and defending that uh, knight that's on f3. Um, he, he went ahead and I, I should say that indirectly, another nice thing, let's step back here, indirectly this uh, rook is putting pressure on f7 as well. And so in some scenarios, if he castled immediately, for example, queenside, this pawn's undefended, it might come under uh, serious pressure. Now, that wasn't the main purpose of my move, but I think he felt that that was an important thing. So he went ahead and defended that pawn, which was fine with me. Um, gave me a tempo to uh, put my king on a safer square. He castled queenside. And this, this move was um, to support a bad idea. <laughs> That I'm going to that I had with the next move, and so uh, I won't belabor it. But I'm, I, I just uh, I needed to um, to get this this pawn uh, it's undefended. I needed to get it out of harm's way, so to speak. So I advance it and get a stronger pawn formation on the um, oops, get stronger pawn formation on the king side. And now I go ahead with my bad idea, which is to advance my d pawn. And the idea here. Uh, was that he would take my pawn and I would take back and then if he took back I can take with the knight and this is actually pretty good for white and he can take back you know if he wants I could take with the bishop but I'm going to end up you know with either a bishop or a queen on the square blockading his isolated queen pawn which uh, which is nice and this all would have failed if I had a uh, pawn that his queen could have taken over here on g4, which is why I went ahead and initiated that the pawn advance in the first place. But the problem with this idea is that the basic idea sucks. <laughs> after, after I played d5, he went ahead and traded off the pawns, but as I noticed while I was sitting there waiting for his move, he doesn't have to take my pawn, he can just play c5. And now, all of a sudden, I'm one move away from losing a piece with a uh, pawn fork, which I have to do something about. I back my bishop off. He goes ahead and advances anyway, and then my queen has to move. And as a result of this, um, my bishop is locked out of the action here on the queen side, um, stuck behind his chain of pawns, which was not a happy situation for me. It, turns out that instead of playing the, in this situation, um, instead of playing my bishop immediately to a2 uh, that I did to, to get out of the fork, the better, cancel that, better idea was to um, go ahead and move my uh, king knight over to the queen side, and now if he advances the pawn, to go ahead and take it, he takes back, I take again, and now I've got a double attack on this pawn. It's not easily defended. Um, best move, according to Stockfish, was just to uh, strengthen his, uh, make his king a little more secure. And then I go ahead, and, well, actually, yeah, the way Stockfish wants to do it is not, not to gobble the A pawn right away, but to first strengthen the D pawn, since that A pawn isn't going away. And he makes a move, and then I take the uh, A pawn. So this way I get three pawns for the piece. It's not too bad. Um, I didn't see that. Didn't see that, though. So um, just looking at my notes here, 
I realized there was something I did want to say, and that's that's um, that's just to point out that it it's tough when you keep making the same mistakes over and over again at the chessboard. And there have been so many games that I have made the mistake of having um, extra space and then prematurely sort of pulling the trigger on a series of exchanges or a pawn break when what I should have done was to maneuver even more. Um, it's, it's really, uh, you know, there's no excuse for it. I, 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 when, I, when I have that kind of um, uh, room like this I, where I can double rooks and everything, he he's really has very little space to move around down here on the, on the black side. If, you, if I swap colors um, and look from his side, I mean, he's got a solid, compact, hedgehoggy sort of formation but it's, um, it's very hard for him to maneuver his pieces. Whereas for me, I, 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 you know, it's very easy to uh, um, move my rook up and over and uh, really, really make this a uh, stronger, one of my rooks, to strengthen this uh, pawn break. I didn't do that. And as a result, when Jim made this move and, and, I, and I thought I was... Um, losing a pawn and also locking my bishop away, as soon as he made this move, he offered a draw. And I, I thought that was a pretty clever draw offer. Um, he, he's made some draw offers that haven't been so clever in the past, but this was a good one. And uh, I have 33 minutes on my clock. He had 58 minutes, so he had twice as much time. I'm gonna be a pawn down. I'm gonna have a bishop that's out of play. It was, uh, it made me think. In fact, I, I spent about eight minutes thinking about it and finally, um, I said no, partly because Fabiano Caruana had just uh, refused to draw in the 12th game of the World Championship in a position that looked like it might be worse for him, but he went ahead and uh, pressed on to try to win that game. And so I figured if he can do it, so can I. So that's part of why I uh, refused to draw. And as a result, I'm playing in an inferior position now. So after trading off my defending knight, he's able to take my d pawn and uh, attack my queen at the same time. So right at this point, he has a uh, nice edge. I forget how much a pawn or so. Let's see. Ooh, minus three. Okay, much more than a pawn. Minus almost minus four. That's um, quite a strong advantage for for black, according to Stockfish. Definitely a winning advantage. Okay, so I went ahead. There's still a lot of chess to be played, I figured. And, uh, you know, like, like at this position, I thought he might play his queen out to, uh, out to g4 here and um, encourage a trade of queens. I mean, maybe he was afraid I would come in with my queen or something. But, um, you know, that, those sorts of moves, I thought, uh, getting active quickly with the black pieces would, would, would be my undoing. Instead, he played this queen to c6. It allowed me to advance my pawn and kick his knight. And his knight fell back. Um, then I decided to uh, go ahead and destroy my kingside pawn structure um, in order to get my bishop out of jail. And I sort of expected him to push the pawn now and, um, and then I would have to push the pawn in order to get my bishop out. That's not the way he chose to play it. Instead, he uh, brought his rook to the center and was threatening then rook takes, rook takes pawn here, which is uh, a pretty strong threat. Nevertheless, I, I persevered, and at this point, I thought his best move was to go ahead and take the pawn with his rook. Um, I don't, does Stockfish agree? Okay, the advantage has gone down a bit. That was, let's go back and see where that happened. Okay, back, yeah, right here where his queen played to c6. Um, Stockfish wants him to uh, centralize his rook to e8 immediately. Um, if he had played my move, yeah, Stockfish isn't too crazy about it, but it's, it likes it better. It's still very good for black. Okay, so instead he, we followed this line. I attacked his knight, it fell back. I opened up um, the diagonal for my bishop. He played his rook over to attack the pawn. I traded off. And now, if he played rook takes pawn, one possibility for me is to play uh, rook takes pawn back. So if he takes here, I can attack his queen. 
and uh, if he takes my queen, I play pawn takes queen. And I'm getting back in the game there. But he chose to take the uh, pawn with his knight. So oh, let's turn the engine off here. So I traded off my uh, bad bishop for his knight. And I was happy to get to this position. Um, I probably should have just traded queens right here. Instead, I tried to penetrate and go after his weak f pawn. So that was one of the reasons I stayed in the game, was that this pawn formation on the uh, king side, even though I didn't mention it at the time, was very weak. And so my pawns, uh, holding these pawns back, would, would keep this guy backward for a long time. It was uh, definitely a, a real plus in the end game. He dropped back to uh, stop my shenanigans with my queen there. So I came back and checked. He came back and blocked. And I wasn't going to go for a trade now. Um, things were starting to look a little better, so I, I traded off the queens and attacked his pawn. He advanced it. Oh, not, not only did I attack his pawn, but I also defended this um, pawn on e4, which I immediately stopped defending in order to get my knight more active and go after this weak square on d6. So his king came and gave a second to defense to that square, so I wouldn't play knight takes pawn. Uh, in this position right now, I'm actually threatening knight takes pawn check, winning the exchange. So, you know, if he had played like rook takes pawn, I can play knight takes pawn check, and then uh, he would be forced to play rook takes knight, because otherwise I'm just winning his whole rook here. Oh, no, I'm not actually. Knight takes rook, bishop takes knight. Okay, so either way, I win the exchange. Either he wins it this way with rook takes knight, or I win it with knight takes rook. Anyhow, he didn't want to do that, understandably, so he came forward with his king. But the problem there is he overlooked the fact that the f7 pawn was undefended. And this, this leads to a total loss. There's, um, it's amazing how the position just crumbles now. So he interposes his rook. It turns out there's nothing else good to do here. If he came forward with his king, I could fork check and win this uh, bishop that's attacked twice. Um, so he doesn't want to do that. He can't come to this square because my knight guards it. If he comes to this square, this square, I can play knight takes pawn check and uh, threatening to win this bishop. So he would have to sacrifice exchange here, rook takes knight, in order to uh, keep me from doing that. And last but not least, if the king went to b8, um, I, what, what did I have? Yeah, well, I had a, um, a mistake is what I had, <laughs> because if I... I was thinking that what would happen is uh, king takes rook, but after knight takes pawn check, um, king over, this knight now is pinned to my rook if I take here. Um, and I'll accept I take with check. So this is not right. Let me uh, go back. Yeah, he actually has to play king to uh, c6. And then if I go ahead and take the rook, he will go ahead and take my rook. And he's actually the exchange ahead. And it turns out that if I do it right, that would be uh, would be roughly even um, in um, in this position after King B8. And the correct move uh, is to go ahead and play my knight to A5, attacking his bishop twice. Right, his bishop can take this nice tasty E pawn. Um, I can come and attack that bishop, but even more to the point, threaten uh, rook b4 check, but he's able to do something about that. Um, he's able to, uh, I guess, just move his king to the corner. And now if I play rook to b4, he would actually play rook to b8, and this is equal. So anyhow, so he could have played king to b7. Yeah, that's right. I, I, 
I forgot about that. It, playing the king to c7 though was a was a bad mistake because I come down with the rook. I'm able to trade off the rooks and then rook takes pawn check. Um, right here I looked at knight takes pawn, which is also interesting. But uh, yeah, that's the one I was thinking of just now when I was saying that that would be good. But um, it is good. But I, I was worried that it was that I would be it was too tricky for my own good. So if I played knight takes, threatening a discovered check, he could have played his rook to b8. And then if I play knight, to, knight takes b7 check, um, you know, I, I've, I've temporarily won a piece, but my knight is pinned. And so king moves away, and if my king moves off the file and he takes my knight, then I'm ahead of pawn in a rook endgame. This, this just wasn't enough of an advantage that, for, you know, I wanted to go down this line. And so instead, I, I went ahead and took the g-pawn, which is much stronger. And he took my pawn in return. It's allowed me to check him. And that square is bad because it loses the bishop. As Same as before. Um, and there were various... So in this situation, I think... Uh, King b8 would not have been good because of knight to d6, forking the bishop and the rook, um, winning material. Yeah. Or, or actually, even more to the point, I could just play rook. Yeah, that's right. Rook takes uh, the bishop and then fork afterward. King moves and uh, knight takes rook and I'm a whole piece up. So... It turns out, if, if you look at it, it's no good regardless of where he goes, but that it's, some of the uh, variations were not as bad as, as losing a whole piece. And so, in this case, I do win the whole bishop. There's he, not much for him to do. He goes over and wins my h-pawn, hoping to uh, push that guy for a queen. But the extra piece is going to be too much. I start to, I just bring my knight back toward the king side. He uh, attacks my pawn. I ought to say... Um, from move 32 onward, um, I, I only had four minutes left at move 32. And so my last 22 minutes uh, was played with a short amount of time. And I ended up with only 30 seconds on the clock, 33 seconds. But fortunately, we have a delay before the move. So you're able to um, win a game that's won, even if you're running out of time, which is nice. Um, so when he attacks my pawn uh, and then pushes his, um, I come over and keep it from going any further. He can't take it because of the knights uh, defending that pawn. He attacked my knight. That doesn't work too well because then I, that gives me uh, the ability to push my pawn forward. And he comes back and attacks the pawn. I can attack the rook. He comes down and check. And I played my king to a2. And he brought his king over, well, Toward the queen side, but also toward that knight that's sitting there trying to help out. But um, I'm able to take the pawn. And then after he attacks my knight, I just um, can ignore that attack and basically take over the g-file. And there's no way for him to keep the pawn from queening now. He comes and attacks my c-pawn. And I could defend it. Um, the reason I didn't defend it very simply is that I didn't want it with my king is... If he played then uh, rook check, um, I, it's true I win his pawn, but then he has time to play rook up and get in front of my pawn on uh, g7, which you know is still going to be a win for white, but it's not quite as clean as um, as just dropping ba dropping back with my rook to defend the uh, c pawn. It's just a matter of technique. And now you know he's free to take my knight, but my pawn. It's going to score a touchdown. He uh, brings his rook back to the center. I get a queen. He drops his rook back to the safety of his king. But now, you know, it's, he's not going to last long. I check with the rook. And he played his king up. I played my queen to this square, boxing his king in, basically. And his rook had to move. Um, he didn't move it. He moved the a-pawn. And that allowed a checkmate. So, it was... Um, Fun game. It was decided, you know, by that, uh, most, mostly by that um, one error that allowed me to take on, that just came a few few uh, moves after I stopped keeping score. Uh, 
when I took with the rook on f7. So when, when he um, came up and de defended this pawn, uh, he really had to let this pawn go and 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 and, uh, and defend the rook and you know defend it. Or or actually, if he had just played um, rook up at that point in time, um, that's better because even though he's losing this pawn, uh, it. At least he's he's not going to lose the uh, f pawn, which is a serious pawn to lose, and so you know play might have gone um, something like this: rook takes, and he can take my e pawn now, or he could trade off the rooks. Um, but either way, oh well, that's going to lose him to the f pawn if he traded off the rooks. I can just play rook takes pawn now, or actually, oh, it's his move. So it won't it won't lose him the pawn. Oh, he's in check. Heh. So he's oh he's losing material. He's either gonna lose the bishop or the rook. Yeah. So that wouldn't have been good. But I'm pretty sure probably the other rook is okay. That looks better. Yeah. Let's see what Stockfish says. Yeah, White has a very small advantage. Yeah. So that would have worked. This rook. Yeah. That would that that would have been bad for him. Oh, plus four. But um, so what he did though was also a, was um, a big loss, but not not as not a, actually not as bad as playing this uh, rook up, which would have been the worst because of allowing this uh, fork. So king up was 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 not good, but it wasn't horrible either. The best move here is just to play d5. Stockfish says. So that's interesting. Playing very actively, but that would take some time. Jim was getting short of time too. He had, at the end of the game, he had five minutes left. So uh, that's what it was. And thanks for, if you're still watching at this point, thanks for watching the whole uh, video. And I'll see you again next week uh, from with my week at the club. Bye bye.